day at the Peer Recovery Workforce Development and Training Center at the University of Maryland and to Adelaide Webster at the Maryland Department of Health. Please know there will be a second session today around 10 minutes after 12 for Eastern Time for peers led by Jen Turk, Executive Director of Voices and Pope in Maryland. And as you may have heard, CEUs will be offered for that webinar. Now for today's webinar, let me, and I'm pleased to introduce Ellen Webster. Ellen is the Vice, Senior Vice President for Health Initiatives at the Legal Action Center, a law and policy organization whose mission is to fight discrimination, build health equity, and restore opportunity for people with substance use disorders, arrest and conviction records, and HIV or AIDS. Ms. Webster, Ms. Weber leads the center's efforts to expand access to comprehensive and equitable substance use treatments both at the state and federal levels and initiatives that enforce the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act in all payer systems. In Maryland, she convenes the Maryland Parity Coalition. Ms. Webster held in the, Ms. Weber, I'm sorry, I'm getting confused with Marcus here. Ms. Weber held an appointment at Professor of Law at the University of Maryland Carey School of Law from 2002 to 2017, where she directed the Drug Policy and Public Health Strategies Clinic. She started her career as a voting rights attorney in the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. Please join me in welcoming one of the co-authors of our report, the incredible, hardworking, diligent Ellen Webster. Ellen Weber, take it away, Ellen. Thanks, thanks so much, Don, and thank you for um, inviting me to to um, report about our our study. And again, um, I was one of the co-authors. The other two folks who drafted the report with me were Sakaya Boasempong and Sally Friedman. Um, so, next slide, please. And Dawn has already identified um, what the Legal Action Center's mission and how we work. So if you could go to the next slide, please. I'll tell you a little bit about the different kinds of work that Legal Action Center does and how this report really fits into that work. Um, so the organization does direct legal services, impact litigation, policy advocacy, uh, training, technical assistance and education and coalitions and collaboration. And um, we were lucky enough to get um, funding from the Bloomberg American Health Initiatives and the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health to actually do this report. So this was part of our, our technical assistance and education work. We're now in the second phase of our project, again, uh, with, the, with the very generous funding of this uh, School of Health um, and uh, what we are now doing is um, several of my colleagues are in New York beginning to provide some direct client assistance to individuals whose families have suffered um, under you know, poor health and, and, and worse as a result of the emergency department experience that they've had. We are beginning to do federal and state policy advocacy and more education in collaboration with groups like Voices of Hope um, in order to be able to spread the word about the, our report, provide education and provide some assistance. So again, thank you for this opportunity. It's really wonderful. And, and thank you for all the work that you've done to reach such a broad audience. The so next slide, please. So I guess the big first question is why are we focusing on emergency departments? Um, again, I think one has to realize that emergency departments are a key point of access to care for substance use disorder treatment. People who use drugs often visit EDs for withdrawal symptoms, for post overdose treatment, for accidents and infections. And we also know from research that this is really one of the key and maybe only points of medical care for individuals with lower incomes and also for individuals in the black and brown communities who have traditionally had less access to treatment in the community. We also all know that overdose, overdose deaths are at an unprecedented high, and that also they're having a disparate racial impact. So we know nationally that there are now over 100,000 deaths annually. Um, it's been a 40% increase just in the last 12 years, 12 months. And in Maryland, again, we're seeing all time highs with regard to um, over, uh, overdose deaths from all substances. We also know that during the pandemic, 
the rate of, of individuals going to emergency departments for overdose related and other substance use emergencies actually increased, even though emergency department visits for other health conditions during the pandemic decreased. So again, the need is significant and emergency departments are really a focus of care. As I mentioned before, we also know in our, in our you know, nationwide need to address health inequities, this is one of the areas of significant inequity. We know that nationally overdose rates have grown faster for among black and Latino people, greater than white individuals. And indigenous people have the highest rates of substance use and opioid misuse. In Maryland, again, we found in just the, the, the most recent report by the office of the, OP, the OOCC that overdose, opioid related fatal overdoses increased substantially among black individuals as compared to a marginal decline of rates among white people in Maryland. We've also known from research that access to medications for opioid use disorder and general medical care post-emergency departments has shown racially disparate impacts. So black patients with opioid use disorders are 77% less likely than white individuals to receive buprenorphine. One study showed that post-emergency department uh, treatment on um, black patients, even those who had commercial insurance, were 50% less likely than white patients to receive follow-up care. So when we look at emergency departments, they really are a point of access, an important point of access to improving all of this and ensuring that people have access to the substance use treatment that they need to improve health. Next slide, please. And so the last point is not only do we have this significant need, but in fact, it is the ED's job to address life-threatening health conditions. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Samuels captured very nicely what the emergency department's role is in our health system. It's a universal point of medical access, diagnosis, treatment, and linkage to definitive care. And we also know based on significant research that's been conducted in the substance use disorder field, that there are best practices that exist for substance use disorder care. There is screening and diagnostic assessment based on the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. There is another best practice is offering to administer medication for opioid use disorders. And there are facilitated referrals to treatment and naloxone dispensing or prescription for individuals who use opioids or other drugs that mix opioids with them. Yet at the same time, we also know that most emergency departments are not adopting these practices. A very recent study just released in, in uh, late 2021 showed that for emergency departments, only one in 12 patients are receiving bu a buprenorphine prescription within 30 days of their discharge from the hospital. But even worse, less than 4% of the 90% of the individuals who had, had no prior buprenorphine dispensing, only 3.9% of those individuals received prescriptions. So it shows that the emergency department is really prescribing in very limited numbers. Same problem with naloxone. Only one in 13 patients, 7.4%, were receiving a naloxone prescription within 30 days of the visit. So again, we are not even seeing among those individuals who get care in an emergency department for this life-threatening condition, they're not getting the medications that will save their lives. Interestingly, naloxone is, is dispensed at a far smaller rate than the drug epinephrine, which is, which is used for anaphylaxis, same type of thing, preventing a life-threatening condition. So we have a lot of work to do. Next slide, please. And finally, all too often, and I know many of you on this call have heard this story way, way too often. Some of you may have even experienced it. And here's just one scenario where we've compiled what is a common practice in ED. And we're gonna be using this throughout sort of the webinar to describe how some of these legal standards apply to this situation. But here's a very classic situation. Lo overdoses on heroin, her neighbor calls 911, telling, asking EMS to, um, come immediately to help save a friend who is overdosed. Flo gets to the emergency department where the hospital staff administer more naloxone. They monitor her respiratory functions and they rehydrate her and they give her some, some medications for withdrawal symptoms that are the result of, of, of administering naloxone. Flo's neighbor though, 
tells the emergency department doctor that she's overdosed many times and that she really needs treatment. She asks the doctor actually to give Flo buprenorphine. Doctor says he can't do that, but once Flo seems to be alert, the doctor discharges her with a list of local treatment programs. Unfortunately, later that evening, Flo's neighbor finds her unresponsive and she dies on the way to the emergency department. So this is a situation that we are, that you and all of us are dealing with on a daily basis. And it's what we've now begun to examine to see what are the best practices? Why aren't these best practices being, being implemented? And what are the legal standards that um, uh, federal legal standards that uh, could be found to be in violation of the law. So next slide, please. So what we're gonna talk about, as I've just said, we're gonna talk about the evidence-based practices. We're gonna identify common reasons for not implementing them. We are going to identify the federal laws that require evidence-based practices and the, pra the ED practices that may violate those laws. We're gonna talk a little bit about enforcing individual rights and the strategies for reform. And then again, we'll take your questions. Next slide, please. So first I wanna talk about the evidence-based practices that um, are actually being admitted, in, implemented in some emergency departments across the country and those that have been supported both by research and the recommendations of experts um, at the highest levels among the, in the federal government and in state and, gov state and local governments, as well as in, uh, in research institutions. So the first evidence-based practice is screening for and diagnosing a substance use disorder. Now let's go back one minute to what the emergency department role is, because again, we are linking each one of these activities, each one of these best practices to what the emergency department role is. So the emergency department role in this context is to determine whether a patient has a substance use disorder that could, that could pose a life-threatening condition. And what that means that is there is screening, which is, is the presenting condition, whether it's an accident, an infection, or other symptom related to substance use and then requires a diagnostic assessment. So we're very familiar with screening brief intervention and referral to treatment. That is a best practice that the American College of Emergency Physicians and the College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma has long endorsed as a best practice in emergency departments, and many follow that. There is also, though, in many individuals who come to emergency departments, we know they don't need to be screened for substance use disorder. Their condition itself demonstrates that they are using substances. In that case, that it's best practice also requires a diagnostic assessment that includes a physical examination and a medical and a substance use history based on the DSM-5 criteria. Many hospitals can adopt those and, and actually incorporate those DSM-5 criteria into their electronic health record so that it makes it a very kind of systematic review of patients. The second best practice is to offer to administer buprenorphine to patients in opioid withdrawal or an untreated moderate or severe opioid use disorder. Now, again, the ED role in this is to identify and treat life-threatening conditions, okay? Um, and in this situation, again, the research has demonstrated and experts have recommended that the, the practice with regard to a patient with a substance use disorder is to treat opioid withdrawal, suppress cravings, and avert opioid overdose through the administration of an opioid agonist medication. We all know that the research demonstrates that the use of opioid agonist medications reduces mortality by 50%. The research to date has demonstrated an ease of administering buprenorphine. There is research that is underway that looks at use of methadone in emergency departments. But for now, the types of consensus recommendations that have been adopted by the American College of Emergency Physicians is to administer buprenorphine whenever you have an individual who is in opioid withdrawal or untreated moderate or severe opioid use disorder. And then the final of best practice is to provide a facilitated referral to community-based substance use disorder treatment, along with naloxone for patients who have who are using opioids or drugs that could be mixed with other opioid med, uh, other opioids. Now, again, the 
links directly into what the emergency department's role is. And that role is to link individuals to definitive care for chronic conditions. Now we all know that the, as we just said in the example with the flow experience, and this is one that is all too often happening, at best patients are getting a list of drug treatment programs that are in the, in the location. That is in the area. That is not a facilitated referral. A facilitated referral is a specific referral with an appointment time if possible to a provider that will be able to treat the patient's condition as well as take that patient's insurance and meet the needs of that individual. And they could be many, it could be transportation, it could be other needs that are unique to that patient. Now that service can be provided by any range of staff peers, social workers, other advocates, and this is all with the goal of navigating their entry into care. So those are the evidence-based practices. And we can, you know, the report that we've identified, the report that we've drafted lists the full range of federal agencies that have endorsed this, all from the U.S. Surgeon General to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, National Institute on Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse, the Substance Abuse and, Health, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and most recently in, in 2021, as I said, the American College of Emergency Physicians has in, issued a consensus statement that provides for these very services. Next slide, please. So what are some of the very frequent reasons that the research has identified or that on the ground experience has indicated are the reasons that hospitals fail to adopt evidence-based practices? We've provided here of sort of what the rationales are and what the responses to those, to those issues are, because this is very often what advocates can use in order to persuade hospitals to begin to adopt these emergency department to, um, to these best practices. Again, very often, if there were ever litigation in this area, one would frequently hear some of these defenses and here are some reasons and some responses to them. So very often, what one most often hears is, this simply is not the emergency department role. They treat life-threatening conditions, not chronic conditions. Another problem, and we all know this is all too often what happens in our, in our healthcare system and in, 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 in almost every point of, of interaction that individuals with substance use disorders face. There's a significant amount of stigma and stereotypes involved. So drug use, for example, is not a choice. It's a choice. It's not a medical condition. Medication sub the medication substitutes one drug for another drug. These are disruptive and very difficult patients. How many times have we all heard that? Another common, uh, another common response is we have very little, little, limited time. We have to move patients in and out of the emergency department quickly. And the EG just doesn't have resources to, to uh, help individuals with substance use disorder. There's a frequent concern about the X waiver that is required to prescribe buprenorphine and the lack of physicians in emergency departments that have the X waiver. Some have concerns about reimbursement. And then the other concern is with regard to limited community providers. So let me take just a few minutes to quickly go down some of these responses because these again link very directly into some of, some of the, the reasons that these, these rationale will not likely hold up in a legal challenge. So it's not the ED role. Well, I think we've already identified what the emergency department role is, right? It's to treat life-threatening conditions and to link individuals to definitive care for, for, for chronic conditions. Clearly, untreated opioid use and substance use disorders are life-threatening. Patients who survive an opioid overdose are 100 times more likely to die by drug overdose in the following year and 18% more likely to die by suicide compared to the general public. And emergency departments actually do provide linkages to care for conditions that are very common chronic conditions such as asthma and diabetes. So this is, pure, this is clearly within the emergency department's role. Well, what about stigma and stereotypes? Well, again, we all know very well that the research has established both the nature and the etiology of substance use disorders and the efficacy of opioid use disorder medications. Um, the failure to provide effective care, you know, leads to patients withdrawal and discomfort in an emergency department. And that very likely results in their irritability, 
that the that, that hospital simply deemed to be a difficult patient. But more likely, the lack of appropriate care results in continued use and a continued return to the emergency departments. So the fact that emergency departments are not providing evidence-based care contributes to the ongoing problem that they observe and the, the patients that they see often on, frequent base, on a frequent basis. The limited time and emergency department resources. So as we mentioned before, it's easy to incorporate the substance use disorder diagnostic criteria into the electronic health record to facilitate frequent and regular um, diagnostic assessments. Research has demonstrated that the initiation of buprenorphine can be performed within the time limits that are often identified for moving patients in and out of emergency departments. As mentioned, and we all know, proper care actually reduces the likelihood of patients returning to the ED, so it reduces the burden on the emergency department. And there can be many services that are provided by affiliated staff. And again, I know you're going to be talking later today about peer staff. And again, peers provide a very important resource as well as others in the department, in, in hospitals to, to do this type of linkage to care. On the X waiver, we know also that the federal government has taken some important steps to reduce the burden on practitioners um, who want to administer buprenorphine and prescribe buprenorphine. Right now, though, Regardless of what those waiver requirements are, hospitals operate on what's called the three-day rule. They are permitted to prescribe or administer opioid agonist medications, whether that's buprenorphine or methadone, for three days without having any other federal authority to do so. And then, as we all know, just recently, SAMHSA has lifted the, the waiver requirements if you are going to um, administer and prescribe, excuse me, prescribe for patients for up to 30 patients. That physician needs to request a waiver, but does not have to un, uh, do the education and provide the social services that are required for other uh, larger patient populations. Reimbursement. Let me talk about that very quickly. Um, insurance law limitations on access to buprenorphine, those probably violate the mental health and substance use, substance use the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, the Parity Act, as we all know. Um, there are state laws that bar insurance reimbursement for injuries sustained while intoxicated. Those are called UPPL laws. They've been removed in many states and they should be removed in others. But interestingly, as we'll hear in a minute, EMTALA bars hospitals from denying services based on insurance status. So concerns about whether a hospital is going to get reimbursed should, in fact, not be at the top of the list as to why you're not going to be doing this. And then finally, limited community providers. There is no question that hospitals must be working with their community-based partners. But when they do, they very often find that there are more resources than that they are aware of. And so that is, again, an activity that must be uh, performed and, and, and ongoing. Uh, next slide, please. I think at this point, been talking a long time, wanted to see if there are any really pressing issues, um, questions, Dawn, that have come up. Hmm. If there aren't, we can keep going and we will um, pick up questions um, at the end. Next slide, please, Jen. So let's now start talking about the federal law protections that really sort of require the delivery of evidence-based services for patients with substance use related conditions. There are three laws that we're going to talk about that our report um, focused on. Um, individuals can satisfy any one of these laws. And if they believe that more than one has been violated, they can bring a claim under, under any number of these laws. There may be some other federal protections out there, but these were the most common ones that we wanted to, to identify. So the first law is the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, known as EMTALA. EMTALA actually requires most EDs 
to examine patients for an emergency medical condition and to stabilize individuals with such a condition before discharging them or transferring them to a different hospital. EMTALA is one of the unique laws in our federal legal system. It is actually a law that requires it, that has an affirmative right to health care. So EMTALA is an important basis for, um, for analysis. The second law is a dis our disability rights laws, the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act. Both of those laws prohibit discrimination on the basis of disability, and that includes persons with current alcohol use disorder, individuals with a history of illegal drug use disorders, and those are who are regarded as having a substance use disorder. The ADA and the Rehab Act also importantly prohibit the denial of health care to individuals based on the current illegal use of drugs. Unfortunately, the Americans with Disabilities Act does not, and the Rehab Act doesn't protect individuals who currently engage in the illegal use of drugs against broad-based discrimination. But what it does do is it has a very important carve out that says that a person cannot be denied health services just because they're engaged in drug use that is illegal. The ADA applies to most public hospitals and private hospitals, and the Rehab Act does the same as long as those entities get federal financial assistance. And then the final law that we've examined is Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. And this is the law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of race or ethnicity. And it also applies to most public and, pu public and private hospitals, again, those that receive federal financial assistance. Um, again, uh, we're going to go. I'm going to go through all of these uh, very briefly right now, uh, and explain um, sort of how, how what the law requires and how they may be violated. Next slide, please. So let's first talk about EMTALA. EMTALA has two two parts to it. First, it requires emergency departments to conduct a medical screening examination, and what this means under EMTALA is that a hospital is obligated for any individual who comes to the emergency department and says they have a health problem that they would like to have examined. All hospitals have an obligation to examine that patient and determine whether the patient has an emergency medical condition. And what emergency medical condition is, is acute systems of sufficient, sufficient severity that absent immediate medical attention, could reasonably be expected to seriously jeopardize that person's health or impair bodily functions. And the law specifically, specifically identifies symptoms of substance abuse or psychiatric disturbances as acute conditions. Okay, so applying this for patients with substance use related conditions, a diagnostic assessment is required to determine if a patient um, has a substance use disorder, and whether it is one of sufficient severity to jeopardize health. And as we all know, untreated substance use disorders can result in respiratory failure, brain or other organ damage, injury, and death. And so it seems quite clear that, um, that when somebody comes to the emergency department with an overdose, with this, an infection that clearly demonstrates the use of drugs, in an accident, that individual should be given a diagnostic assessment to determine whether they have a substance use disorder and the severity of that. Now, the one thing under EMTALA to understand is that emergency departments really have fairly broad discretion to identify what that medical screening examination is going to look like and what their protocols are. And it can in fact vary by the emergency department's capability. So how, how is this obligation violated? So the first thing is, if an emergency department conducts no diagnostic assessment to determine if a patient presenting with acute systems of alcohol or drug use actually has a substance use disorder, that would be identified as a failure to screen. A second way this law is violated is if an individual comes to the emergency department and the emergency department does not provide the same level of screening and diagnostic assessment that is provided to all other patients presenting with similar medical complaints associated with substance use disorders. 
sometimes. And so, so what you can imagine is because the hospital has fairly broad discretion under EMTALA as to what its medical examination is going to look like, one could imagine a situation in which a hospital provides a very cursory review of the patient, a very cursory medical exam, so that it, in fact, fails to identify many medical emergency conditions. So some courts will actually examine whether or not that screening procedure was so cursory or so inadequate as to amount to no appropriate medical screening. And in that situation, the court could also find that there's a screening violation. Another important thing to remember is that the misdiagnosis or the failure to identify a medical emergency condition is not an EMTALA violation. It may very well be a violation of another law, it could be medical malpractice, but it is not an EMTALA violation. So again, you can see some of the weaknesses in this law, some of the limitations in this law, yet nonetheless, it does provide some very good protections. Next slide, please. Now, the second part of the EMTALA obligation is that the ED must stabilize patients with emergency medical conditions. So if there is an emergency medical condition that's been identified through the screening, then what the ED is obligated to do is to provide medical treatment that, with, that within sort of reasonable medical certainty will prevent the material deterioration of a patient's condition following the discharge or a transfer to another hospital. This, quite differently from the, from the screening, the screening is you just really have to provide the same screening to all patients who pre present with substance use related conditions. In this situation, however, the care has to actually be tailored to that individual's condition. It's not uniform treatment, it's what's needed by this patient. It must resolve the medical emergency. It doesn't have to treat the underlying condition, but that medical emergency has to be resolved before that patient is discharged. So the reason this triggers obligations for EDs with regard to patients with substance use disorders is that emergency department staff know that patients will continue to use drug or, drugs or alcohol in a potentially life-threatening way if their withdrawal symptoms or cravings are not effectively treated. And that's what triggers some of these very specific stabilization requirements. So material deterioration that is foreseeable at discharge requires the ED staff to try to prevent those foreseeable um, conditions that will in fact, in fact have that patient's condition decline in a very serious fashion after discharge. Hope that's clear. So let me give you some ideas of what violates that obligation to just flesh that out a bit. So for patients with, uh, with untreated opioid use disorder, the failure to provide an opioid agonist medication to treat withdrawal and suppress cravings to prevent overdose is, is clearly a violation because it is, it is the, the ED is failing to prevent a foreseeable material decline in that patient's condition. They know that without treating those opioid, without treating cravings, they will, and a patient will invariably return to drug use um, and could have, again, a fatal effect. Um, again, the failure to help arrange treatment for a substance use disorder treatment through a facilitated referral. Again, ED staff know that without access to treatment, individuals upon discharge will likely return to drug use that could have fatal consequences. Again, so without providing that facilitated discharge to treatment, right, the facilitated referral to treatment at discharge, you are, again, of violating, violating this obligation. And then again, the failure to provide naloxone for patients who use opioids or drugs that are mixed with opioids, again, raises this same problem. ED staff know that an individual is likely to go out and, and resume drug use in a dangerous way. And to not provide the medication that can prevent that overdose is a failure to stabilize, all right? So next slide, please. I'll show you quickly how this applies in our, in, our, in our case. So remember Flo, she overdosed on heroin. She's treated as the ED. Um, her friend asks that, um, that she be given um, 
uh, buprenorphine and that clearly that she needs treatment. She's not given buprenorphine and she's not given a specific referral to treatment. So the question is, has the emergency department screened, has they violated their screening obligation? And that's a potential violation here if they didn't conduct a diagnostic assessment to identify opioid use disorders. They very well may have just treated the acute symptoms that Flo presented to the ED without doing the diagnostic assessment. And that is important because they are required to identify emergency medical conditions. Not only that's required for their, their screening obligation, but it also triggers their stabilization obligation. So the second question is, have they stabilized floor, Flo's SUD? And here it's pretty clear that they didn't. They did not offer to administer buprenorphine and they did not arrange follow-up care at a specific treatment program that could deliver care to her. Now the one hey, thing Ellen, to remember, yes. Ellen, this is Don. Along that line, we have a question from Maureen. Are physicians without a waiver allowed to prescribe only and administer only three days of buprenorphine? The writer says, I thought the rule only allowed a patient to return to additional days in a row to receive bup administered by the emergency department. If it's three-day prescription is allowed, would that help a lot of the EDs? That's a very good question. There was a recent rule change that required the three days to be a three-day um, prescription as opposed to requiring the patient to come back for three, you know, for three days sequentially. And so there were there, that was passed by Congress, and there should be some rulemaking proceedings that actually should be done by now to have put that into place. Okay. Uh, this is Jeffrey Davis from the American College of Emergency Physicians. Yes, the DEA was supposed to issue regulations by June of last year, but they're now eight months late in doing so, or nine months late in doing so. Great. Thank you, Bia, for that follow-up. So the one other thing, if there are no other questions, the one other thing to identify here is that if, this, if an individual were to bring a case, there would need to be proof that the harm that they've suffered resulted from the emergency department's failure to screen or failure to, to stabilize. If, so next slide, please. We're going to talk now about the Rehabilitation Act. So under the ADA and the Rehabilitation Act, um, it violates federal law to discriminate against people because of or on the basis of disability. Very often, individual actions are based on stereotypes and generalizations about people with substance use disorder rather than legitimate and individualized medical reasons. So, and very often the reasons that are given as we identified in that earlier slide are based on stigma and not grounded on sort of an objective individualized fact. That's a violation of the ADA. In addition, the law um, bars emergency departments, hospitals from administering a program. And the emergency department is a program. It is providing a medical service to the public. So administering that program in a manner that has the purpose or the effect of discriminating on the basis of disability. As I er said earlier, the ADA and the Rehab Act explicitly bar the denial of health services to people who are currently engaging in illegal drug use because of that drug use. And then finally, another claim that can be made under the Americans with Disabilities Act is refusing a request of a reasonable accommodation. A reasonable accommodation is a modification to a policy or practice that will allow access to healthcare services. So this is a requested policy change that would not fundamentally alter the emergency department service or impose an undue burden. Next slide, please. I want to show you how that how that can play out in Flo's case. So, for, so again, going back to Flo's case, her friend tells the doctor that she needs treatment and asks the doctor to give buprenorphine. The doctor said that this emergency department doesn't offer buprenorphine and he doesn't have the so-called permission or the waiver to administer it. Instead, he gives her medications that are less effective in treating opioid withdrawal and doesn't suppress cravings. And then again, gives the list of programs, and, and, uh, and, but also instructs her to have naloxone on hand. 
So where are the possible violations in this situation? Well, one, the emergency department's denial of buprenorphine to flow could violate the ADA. So their hospital policy to not offer buprenorphine is a method of, of administration. It's how they run their emergency department services for patients with substance use disorders. And that has an effect of denying health services to individuals who use opioids. The denial could also be disparate treatment based on the stereotypes who use uh, stereotypes about people who use opioid uh, who, has, who have opioid use disorders. But again, not legitimate stereotypes, obviously. For example, remember our, our, our rationale. Offering buprenorphine will attract drug users to our emergency department. It involves too much DEA oversight. Doctors must have an X waiver. It just takes too much time. Again, there are responses to all of those. Very often those rationale are based on stereotypes, unfounded stereotypes, not individualized decisions about that person's medical condition. And again- Ellen, I have another question if I could. Uh, sure. People with mental illness and take Xanax for treatment, but have an overdose on the legal use of this medication? Do they have the same rights as a person who takes illegal drugs, but have an overdose legal dependence, but unaddressed addiction to Xanax? Are yes. there medical assisted treatment for those people while in the emergency room? Also, so any notions about the future of psychedelics? That's a long question, but I think the Xanax one is uh, especially key. Yep. So let me answer the one about Xanax. Um, so the under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the definition of an individual who engages in the illegal uses of illegal use of drugs is defined so that it is a drug drug use that is not prescribed medications. It includes so for somebody who is taking Xanax that is prescribed, that is not the illegal use of drugs if the individual is using consistent with the medical with with the prescription. But as I said, nonetheless, even if that individual were not engaging in legal drug use, right, that person is still protected under the ADA from um, uh, in the context of they cannot be denied health care services. So all of these protections would apply um, to all individuals who are presenting at, a, at, a, at the emergency department with substance use disorders and an overdose. Okay. Um, so, as I said, uh, this reasonable accommodation requirement is one in which, again, an individual could ask a could ask the emergency department to prescribe, or, or excuse me, to administer buprenorphine to them, and um, and again, very likely that that request would probably be a reasonable request. Um, and again, don't have the time to sort of go through the details on that, but very, but again, emergency departments administer medications for all sorts of conditions. They administer um, all sorts of pain relief medications. Um, they stock <clears throat> virtually all medications. And so to uh, indicate that this is any kind of fundamental alteration of, the, of what they do in the emergency department um, is likely not to be, uh, to hold a lot of water. Um, so the second, the second way that one could potentially make out a claim under the ADA is also, did their failure to provide a direct referral to substance use disorder treatment violate the ADA or the Rehab Act? And again, this could be based, the failure to do that could be based on illegal stereotypes. How many times have folks have heard the things that the, the statement, well, individuals with substance use don't want to stop using drugs or they won't follow up. Denying that type of referral that's targeted uh, to a particular program who could provide services um, is again um, based on stereotype and, and not an individual decision about this particular patient. Again, not providing targeted referrals could be a method of administration that has the effect of discriminating on the basis of, of an individual's health care needs. And again, the failure to provide a reasonable accommodation if the patient actually requests a direct referral. Again, wouldn't it, hospitals provide direct referrals for virtually every single other medical condition? Um, so this would not in any way be a fundamental alteration of what they do as a, as a, as a matter of, of protocol. Ellen, a question yes. along that line from Kelsey. 
Has anyone had success in using the Americans with Disabilities Act in protecting individuals on Suboxone or methadone and discrimination? So very good question. And this is one of the things that it's important for people to know. The, the analysis that we've presented in our report is, is, a ba is based on you know, the law, it's based on other cases that are analogous to this situation, but there has been no direct case that, that applies EMTALA, the ADA, or Title VI to this particular situation. There have been many cases that have been brought, brought over the last few years that have looked at the failure to provide methadone to individuals who are, in, um, uh, incar who are incarcerated. Same thing with regard to buprenorphine. And in many of those cases, they actually are relying on the Americans with Disabilities Act and the, and the Rehabilitation Act and find violations by those correctional systems for the failure or discontinuation of medications for opioid use disorder. So we, again, in our analysis, rely on those cases significantly. So what that means is when we are doing our advocacy, when we are representing clients, when you are doing advocacy, there is a lot of education that must be done in order to um, help hospital administrators and to help others understand how these laws apply. But you are going to be raising some novel legal theories and uh, we'll, we'll need to do some education around that. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so the last claim that, um, <clears throat> that we analyzed is whether or not these laws, whether the, the refusal to, uh, to provide evidence-based practices could violate Title VI um, as prohibited uh, race discrimination. And again, very quickly, um, there are, under, the, under, the, under Title VI, the intentional denial of specific services because of a patient's race or ethnicity is a violation of Title VI. And what an individual would have to do in this situation, they would have to show that, that race or ethnicity was a substantial and motivating factor in the emergency department's decision not to provide evidence-based practices. And that can be done through proof of direct or indirect, indirect proof of that race or ethnicity was involved in the decision-making process. There doesn't have to be proof of malice, but there does have to be evidence that race was a, a substantial consideration in the decision-making process. Another way, another way that um, the a, a violation of Title VI can be found is if there is a failure to offer, that the failure to offer one of these evidence-based practices has a disproportionate negative impact on patients of a specific race or ethnicity. In this situation, it is the Federal Office of Civil Rights that must bring this type of claim. And they will have to have race and ethnicity data and demonstrate that there's this causal link between the emergency department's practice and the disparate racial or ethnic group that's impacted. And then there is also a violation if there's actually a provision of a service in a manner that disproportionately negatively impacts individuals of a particular race or ethnicity. And again, these are claims brought by the Office of Civil Rights only. Um, and the same items, the same issues arise. There's going to need to be significant data about, developed and there must be a demonstration there's a causal relationship between the policy and the negative uh, impact based on race. So, uh, Ellen, I, Ellen, I don't want to just get away from the, the racism question, but we do have a, a question from, from Aaron at Caesar at the University of Maryland, one of, one of my favorite people in the world. She asked, does a diagnostic assessment for substance use disorder have to include toxicological testing, for example, urinalysis? If the <laughs> test panel is limited and does not include common drugs of abuse, such as fentanyl, is that screening adequate? Very good question. And again, under EMTALA, <clears throat> under EMTALA, the law itself gives great discretion to the emergency department in terms of what that diagnostic assessment is. It does not necessarily have to include toxicology um, uh, testing and, and at all. Again, the experts that we've spoken with um, have indicated that, that a diagnostic assessment really can be based on a medical exam, a physical exam, identifying what that individual's history of substance use disorder is, and you know, following the DSM criteria. So the 11 criteria in the DSM to make that diagnostic assessment. 
Okay, so um, if you are raising this case under EMTALA, very often courts will be faced with the situation where particular medical tests have not been performed. Again, it's going to examine what the capability of that department was. And again, it, it, EMTALA does not uh, uh, identify specific um, diagnostic tests that must be performed. Okay. Other questions on that? Why don't we go very quickly to the next slide so we can I just apply this to a case to the same case study. So again, you know the you know the background here. Um, does the denial of buprenorphine to flow, um, you know, sort of did the did the ED not deny flow buprenorphine because of her race? And again, in this situation, more information needs to be known. We're assuming here that flow is black, and so that's a question that would require again, additional analysis. Some of it is, if, if Flo were bringing this case, some of it would be, she would have to demonstrate that, that again, race played a was a motivating uh, factor in this decision. And again, in some situations, that could be based on things such as the ED staff was overheard hearing that, you know, we're not gonna provide buprenorphine to this individual because she'll probably sell her buprenorphine. Or again, a comment such as black people are better off on methadone rather than, um, or on no medication at all. Perhaps Flo's friend knew of a white patient who was offered buprenorphine by that very same ED. Again, but, but Flo, who's black, was not. Another way one could examine this is that a hospital system perhaps may be piling a buprenorphine initiation, initiated program in an emergency department that serves a predominantly white population but it's not doing the same in a community that serves a predominantly black population. Again, one has to examine what is the ED's so-called legitimate and non-discriminatory rationale for denying that care to um, a black patient. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and then finally, if we were taking a look at what the Office of Civil Rights does when they examine whether an emergency department's practice of not providing buprenorphine to patients disparately impacts black, black patients like Flo, more information is needed. And these are the types of, this is the type of <clears throat> analysis of the race data among individuals in the community who have opioid use disorders who need buprenorphine. Is that dramatically higher than white populations or other populations? Um, and you know, what is the racial breakdown of patients who are served by the ED, the diagnosis of SUD, and the treatment referral patterns. One needs to take a look at that information. It's something that the Office of Civil Rights is uniquely um, situated to do. Um, and so there is a sort of significant analysis and information gathering that is needed. Very often what we see with hospital emergency studies and other data, race data is collected, but it very often is not reported. It's often very incomplete. And so a lot more digging needs to be done in order to create a basis for these Title VI cases. Ellen, if I can ask another question, this is from Jordan. He asked, what is the recourse for these violations? How does someone report an emergency department for violating the ADA? It's Jordan's experience that very few people know what their rights are and how to file a form of complaint notes that if we don't start holding providers accountable, nothing will change. And we are going to get to that in one minute. So if you can bear with Thank me, you. I will. I, we have a slide that provides how individuals are, um, where they should go in order to file complaints under any one of these laws, as well as in Maryland. So with your um, indulgence, let me go through a few more slides and we'll get there. So next slide, please. <laughs> next slide. So as we've talked about it, there are really these multiple strategies to improve the implementation of evidence-based practices. There is education that's required of consumers and providers, hospital administrators, and regulators on all levels, federal and state. There needs to be federal and state action. There can be legislative requirements. There can be funding incentives to help hospitals move in the right direction. And state professional associations and hospital practices themselves, often those entities often take the lead in some of these activities. And then finally, as we've just noticed, 
individual complaints. These lead to federal agency investigations, and that often is also important in moving hospitals into doing evidence-based practices. So I'm going to quickly race through these um, just so that you see sort of what else, what you know, what we should be doing looking forward um, in order to improve the situation. The next slide, please. So one thing that's happened very recently in the federal in, in the federal agenda is the Biden administration's unity agenda, which is linked here, um, has indicated that they are striving to have universal access to medication for opioid use disorders by 2025, and that includes removing unnecessary barriers to prescribing uh, to, to practitioner prescribing. They, within the next year, are expected to release recommendations for hospital overdose care and care coordination and a model state law. And then finally, that unity agenda, I think, had a very important statement. It said that hospital emergency departments offer a unique setting to initiate treatment, provide naloxone, and connect patients with peer support services. That, to, uh, to me, sends a very strong federal message that we should all be taking advantage of. There are funding incentives right now. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have implemented Medicare billing codes to reimburse hospitals for emergency department, opioid use disorder assessment, medication initiation, referral to care, and access to supportive services. All payer systems should have those same billing codes. And then regulatory investigations, as we mentioned, not only can the Office of Civil Rights examine racially disparate impact there are other agencies that can as well. So the Centers for Medicare Services enforces EMTALA. They, they issue a standard operating procedure that guides hospitals. They should include within that standard operating procedures these evidence-based practices. Next slide, please. Federal and state policy activity. So I'm not gonna go through all of these in the few minutes that we have left, but just so that you know, there are some important resources here. States have enacted legislation. Massachusetts has a very important model. There are funding incentives. Pennsylvania has provided incentives for hospitals to implement buprenorphine initiation and warm handoffs. There is medical professional guidance. The American College of Emergency Physicians, they have a tool in their, on, their, on their website called BUP. It is a toolkit for initiating buprenorphine in emergency departments. The Colorado <clears throat> Association for the College of, of, of Emergency Physicians have put out guidelines as well. And I want to repeat, and we put a link to this in the slides, the American College of Emergency um, uh, Physicians has issued a consensus statement that should be used and, uh, in all the advocacy that you're doing. And then finally, if you want to look to individual hospital practices, the California Bridge Program, which is linked here, is essential. They have done an, an amazing job in, in providing not only access, um, bridge access services for buprenorphine, but also for individuals with alcohol use disorders. And before we end, uh, I want to make sure we all understand what Maryland is doing. Maryland hospitals were some of the first <clears throat> to do buprenorphine in emergency departments. And I want to go to that last slide um, so just that you can see where we are in Maryland. Um, as, you, as you all know, the HOPE Act in 2017, excuse me, incorrect number there, in 2017 required all hospitals to submit their discharge protocols for treating overdose um, or individuals identified as having a substance use disorder. The Maryland Hospital Association issued a report. They identified four core components. All of what we've spoken about so far, with the exception of initiating medication for opioid use disorders. Only 27% of the reporting of the hospitals reported at that time were initiating buprenorphine. So there is obviously still a lack of care out there. The Maryland Hospital Association said in that 2019 it would be focusing on working with hospitals and community partners to increase access to medications for opioid use disorders in emergency departments and communities. There's lots of work that still needs to be done, and there's a lot of collaboration that still needs to be done. And then finally, the last slide. This provides you with where individuals should go to file complaints. And TOLA complaints, the best place to go is to the CMS regional office. If you click on that link, you will identify what that office is. So the part for the ADA and Rehab Act, the complaint can be filed at the Department of Justice website, also linked here. And then for Title VI, the Office of Civil Rights, there's a link to that. In Maryland, 
Marylanders should file complaints about specific hospital practices with the Maryland Department of, of Health, the Office of Healthcare Quality. Very often, the regional offices for CMS refer people back to the entity that takes hospital complaints in their state, and that is the Office of Healthcare Quality. We've linked there the complaint form for you. And then finally, if you have individual stories and you would like to submit those to the Legal Action Center, here is the link where we are actually collecting stories. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you for your indulgence. I'm, I'm sure there are other questions. I'm happy to answer them. Um, uh, if they're submitted to me, happy to get that information back to you. <clears throat> Alan, we're, we're uh, starting to run on, on time. If a couple, we can get back to questions that uh, we can reply to people, not as attorneys, but just referring to the report. Um, I just want to make a, 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 first of all, thank you so much for a great presentation and your wonderful energy and expertise. Um, just to remind folks, this was not about trying to shame or embarrass hospitals and emergency department. We all have the same goal, and that's to help people that need treatment get treatment. And there have been a lot of studies, so I just sent Ellen one that came out from the RAND Corporation that shows that just even with the best of treatment in emergency departments, if that's not sustained through recovery pathways, through cooperation with, with doctors, recovery community mm -hmm. organizations, treatment programs, that whatever good may be attained in the short term for treating the crisis in the emergency department doesn't sustain over time. So we, we want to work on this, how we can have warm handoffs and good cooperation between all the, the key players, emergency department, service organizations, what have you. This recording will be posted on the Voices of Hope uh, webpage. Uh, give us a couple of days to do it. And that's voicesofhopemaryland.org, all spelled out, voicesofhopemaryland.org. So we'll do that. So with, with that, um, we have a second half uh, today for a session that Jen Turk is leading with, with peers. Ellen, I don't know if you have any final comments or not before we turn it to Jen, but- uh, no, Just to thank you I, very much for participating and thank you for the opportunity. <clears throat> thanks, Ellen, you did a wonderful job. Thanks everybody. Jen, over to you. Okay, we're gonna let everybody who's not a peer recovery specialist sign off. We're gonna be coming back on at 12.15 for the peer part. If you're a peer recovery specialist, we invite you to stay tuned. You will get uh, CEUs from the Maryland Addiction and Behavioral Health Professional Certification Board and Advocacy for uh, attending and participating in the conversation to follow up. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>